Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. A year ago, Dana White was questioning whether her business could survive the pandemic. This week, she tells us she's looking seriously at expanding to another city. I'd like to make a decision by the end of March, she says, and I'd like to be opening or in the process of opening by this fall. I'm waiting to see how the vaccine does. Dana also talks about her recent experiences with venture capitalists, who seem to be telling her, we'll be happy to give you money as soon as you don't really need it. Plus, Stephanie Stuckey explains her team's recent three-hour debate. Should Stuckey's be selling the road trip or the pecan? And Dana, Stephanie, and Jay Galtz discuss Clubhouse, the new social media platform. Is it just a time suck or does it offer real value to business owners? Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will, if nothing else, let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, which collects the most important news of the day for business owners in one place, and which you can subscribe to at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes. This week's lineup features Jay Goltz, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home. Stephanie Stuckey, who is CEO of Stuckey's, the snack and road stop business famous for its pecan log rolls and Dana White, who is CEO of Parley Boyd, a chain of hair salons based in Detroit. The episode is titled, Chicago, New York, or Atlanta? Before we get started, one of the recurring themes of this podcast is that marketing is hard for smaller businesses. One reason it's hard is that we are all besieged by self-appointed digital marketing gurus who overwhelm us with outlandish promises. On the other hand, there's Steve Krull, co-founder of Be Found Online. A loyal listener to the 21 Hats podcast, Steve understands the business owners who listen to this podcast because he is one. He knows his stuff, but he's also a real person who you can have a real conversation with. And if you tell him I sent you, you can get a free consultation with Steve himself. Just shoot him an email at steve at befoundonline.com to schedule your talk. That's steve at befoundonline.com. Now on to the show. Welcome, Dana, Jay, and Stephanie. Thanks for joining me today. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm good. Still still fighting a good fight. Anything going on on the, the loan front that you've uh, been telling us about? I have a proposal, but they're trying to sell this as a business loan versus real estate. So there's all kinds of, you know, caveats in there. So no news. No, I do have news. A bank actually called me that used to be a banker that was with one of the previous banks and is looking for business. So I'm still extremely confident that I will find a bank that will be happy to have us. Stephanie, how are you doing? We're doing great. We've acquired the candy plant manufacturing facility and we're- Which we talked about last week. Knee deep, neck deep in strategery, as I joke. (laughs) We're doing strategic planning. We're getting our teams aligned. And there's a lot that you have to do with a merger and acquisition well beyond just the legal paperwork. Give us an example. What, What kind of thing are you referring to? We have three different accounting softwares. Uh, so ouch. which accounting software are we going to use? How do we integrate all of that? Uh, today, we had a, a very in-depth conversation about integrating all of our websites into one website. Packaging. We're redoing all of the packaging and Stuckey's will be the lead brand. But then we had a conversation about one of the subsidiary brands. It, is it Front Porch Pecans? Stuckey's Front Porch Pecans or is it just Stuckey's because Front Porch Pecans has a certain following. So we we agreed we were going to do Stuckey's Front Porch Pecans, but that was a lengthy discussion. And then just making sure everyone's aligned on what the brand is. We had a three-hour discussion about whether Stuckey's is about the road trip or about the pecan. And the road trip won out, but it was a three-hour discussion. So a lot, branding, marketing, accounting, can I take you back to the websites? P- people struggle so much with one website. How are you approaching the decision on how to handle three? We have got outside consultants who did a model today. They did a demo and they showed us how we could integrate. And the exciting thing is as we're integrating, we're upgrading, hopefully. And it's, we're, because we're, we're putting everything into one, we're going to be saving money ultimately, even though the new system is slightly more expensive than what we're paying right now. It's less than three separate 
systems. And it's going to enable us to do so much more. Right now, we are very clunky about how we manage our wholesale accounts. They literally email us and then we follow up with an email and then I will send them a form to complete that's a Word doc. (laughs) So we're going to have everything integrated on the website where they can just order straight from our website and it can be immediately processed. Our sales reps will be able to go on the site and when they're at a store, instead of doing a hand order, they can order via the website. How did you choose the consultants who are helping you with this? My business partner was in charge of that. So it was a contact that I brought to him. It's someone I know who I've known for about 20 years. He's an investor in this company and they provide the software. It's called Gift Key. And another key factor for us is that the, one of the companies we acquired has a robust fundraising business and Gift Key has a lot of software related to fundraising. So it makes it really easy to have hundreds of users log into the system and place orders for fundraising. So they're uniquely in our space. And it's a Georgia-based company, which we like. Can I ask you a question just to push back a little bit on your conclusion after your three-hour meeting? It, you said it's about the road trip. How many stuckies did, did, was there at their peak and how many are there now? 368 at our peak, 67 today. So I would, I would challenge your question. So they're used to... It, those days are gone. There aren't 368 anymore. So just because someone have warm, wonderful memories of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, you, there's not as many there's not as many restaurants out there. So can you really recreate the road trip thing when you're when you're 20 percent of the size you used to be? Is that is that a smart strategy to go back to something that was 30 years ago? Absolutely. It's all about storytelling. When you look at my LinkedIn post, I had one LinkedIn post that talked about how much I loved to go road tripping and the anniversary, the one year anniversary of me taking over Stuckey's. I checked that post yesterday. It had reached over a million engagements. Wow. Those people engaging with my post on LinkedIn, they're not stopping at Stuckey's necessarily on the side of the road, but they're connecting with the story. I can weave a story around the wonderful experience you have of getting in the car and exploring, whether you actually road trip or not. You can go ride the cyber highway, get on the internet, and buy our product. The product supports that. The product is part of the story. But what is leading with the brand is how we tell the brand story, how I'm able to communicate to people what makes Stuckey's different. When you're a small business, which we all are, you can't be just like everyone else. I can't compete with Pilot or Loves or Truck Stop of America. There's no way. There's thousands of them. They're 20,000 square feet. Bucky's, they're huge. You need a GPS to find the bathroom. We can't compete with that. What we can compete with is we were the OG of the road trip. We were founded in 1937. We were founded before there was even an interstate highway system. We can own the road trip. That is our differentiator. Mm. That's what makes us unique and special. And I can weave that story all day long. That's our brand. What's the connection to the sales though, Stephanie? Do you think somebody's going to buy your product uh, online and then take it with them when they take a road trip? Or is it just the the nostalgia about the road trip that makes them want to buy that pecan log? All of the above. I'm telling you, I will do a post on social media and I'll talk about road trips and I'll mention, by the way, you should buy our pecan log roll. When we do those posts, when we send out an e-blast, we tell these stories sales skyrocket. Our sales are up. Our online sales this month are up 550%. I sold over 500 bags of our Southern Sweets line in the past week with a handful of posts and almost no marketing budget. I boosted one post on Facebook and I did three e-blast and a bunch of posts on LinkedIn. Okay. I think that's a good answer. I think you're talking about branding. You've got a unique branding thing that resonates with people. And I think that makes sense. Good answer. And it's back okay. by data. It's not just anecdotal. I'll just leave it yeah. with that. That We look at the Google Analytics and you can trace what the origins of your sales are, the actual conversions, what's the source. And the post that talk about the road trip 
get the most conversions to actual sales. So mm-hmm. it's it's backed up by evidence. And this was a this was a lengthy discussion. So trust me, we we really did weigh heavily that well we should be we should be selling the pecan, but the pecan's a product. The road trip is a brand. The road trip is a story. How many people were in the room for this three hour discussion? Oh, 10. And by, at the end, everybody signed off on it. Every single person. And okay. the interesting thing, it was like 12 angry men. We started <laughs> out and you can tell which side I was on from the get go. Me and one other person, the the person on our board who is a marketing professional, we were the two who wanted to do the road trip. Everyone else wanted the pecan. And by the end, everyone was not only for the road trip, they were convinced. Dana, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Laura. And I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. Glad to be open. You know, pandemic life. I'm okay. Hanging in there. That's it. <laughs> Has business picked up? No, we're in the middle of our slow season. Uh, January and February are slower months. And, you know, here in Michigan, the weather has been um, in the high teens to 20s. I think yesterday was the first day we started coming out of that. So um, Valentine's Day, we saw, you know, a little bit of pickup. But, you know, this is our slow season, our quiet time, right before the, the spring, Mother's Day, Easter holiday stuff. I gather you're using some of that quiet time to think a little bit about expansion. Yes, I am. I, um, you know, when we had spoken before on the show with my demo day money, I was looking at VC dollars. Um, you know, the demo day money kind of puts you on the platform saying, okay, she is the grand prize winner. So she has $200,000. Um, so you attract venture capitalists. I think, and I was considering it and I'm still considering it. We should repeat for people who maybe didn't hear the previous episodes, you, you were the big winner at Detroit Demo Day back in the fall. Uh, you won the $200,000 grand prize. And, and you're talking about venture capital because um, h- how is that connected to the, um, the award? Because once you get that money, VCs look at it as first money in. I see. You, you become more attractive at that point. Exactly. So they, you know, say, hey, let's look at your business. And a lot of them said, you know, love your business model, love what you're trying to do. Um, And, you know, they sell you uh, rapid growth, rapid expansion. This is our network. This is our fund. This is how much capital we have access to. Um, And you're like, oh, okay. Um, But then there's a lot of things that aren't communicated where they are. Um, in acquiring or, you know, taking on new businesses uh, where they are in their timeline. So they may not be ready as, as they, as we thought they were, or they communicated they were, we still have work to do. So it's, you know, about growing Paralee Boyd. And although, you know, and I've spoken with several entrepreneurs here in Detroit, and we've all said Detroit is a great place to start a business, but because we don't have the population density, it's not the best city to test the legs of your business to see, okay, what can this really do? So I'm looking, seriously looking and have been working towards expansion to other cities that have population density. I have this feeling that right now is a good time. One, because I'm sitting on this cash and two, because there were a lot of businesses that unfortunately had to close. 40% of African-American businesses around the country is closed, which is sad. So okay, but how could you make that, you know, something that works to your advantage by looking at, you know, good real estate, negotiating good real estate prices, um, but strategically picking cities that have bounced back from COVID or have, you know, gotten through COVID a little bit stronger than other ones and have the population density that I'm looking for. We've talked in the past, you used to live in New York and you've thought that would be a good location. Are you thinking about New York now? I'm still considering New York. Uh, my concern is that the MTA is still, you know, I won't say struggling, but they're not back to where they were. My other concern is that roughly 400,000 people left New York City. That's huge. And even though those people may not be my customers, it still speaks to the, you know, you know, the density issues. So I am looking at the MTA because that is one of the heartbeats of New York City. And as the MTA goes, as the city goes. So if the MTA is not up and running, if they're seeing their ridership down, that means people are staying hyper local. They're not getting on the subway and going into Manhattan to get their hair done. They're walking to where they need to go get their hair done. 
So that would mean, you know, if I'm in Manhattan, my customers need to be within walking distance of me or in Brooklyn. So that's what I'm looking for. But I'm looking at, you know, pretty much every major city, um, Chicago, Atlanta, New York are my are my top ones right now. Have you been looking at real estate prices? I have. What are you finding? That there are really good options for sale. You know, the issue in buying a salon is when you buy a salon, the owner wants you to buy their business and they don't want you to change their business. They want the business. Now, it can, but you're buying all of their employees, all of their stock. You're buying their database. And again, my business is unique. So, you know, a 16 chair blowout bar with 16 stylists, hair color, that's not that's not anything I need. Their database is likely not anything I need. So it, it's hard to find the, the right salon to purchase um, because I'll be buying stuff I don't need. Given what you just said, why would you buy a salon? Why wouldn't you just lease or buy empty space that you could create your own thing in? Well, you know, buying a, buying is not ideal. Leasing for my business model is ideal, but you know, there's everything that comes with leasing. I can't tell you how many small business owners I know. I'm one of them. Where my first location, my Southfield location, one of the reasons why I closed it was because of the landlord. When you're dealing with landlord, you have a silent partner that can make or break your business if they're not, you know, um, mediating or remediating the mold in your space. Then you can't live there. You can't work there long. You have to find someplace else. I can make the argument in small retail that that you should try to buy uh, your space because eventually, if you're younger and you started in business, your landlord is going to die or retire and their kids are going to take over and sell it to somebody or something. And you just don't have stability. And I will also tell you from personal experience, I opened up a store downtown right by the Merchandise Mart, a small condo. It's a condo store. So there is an opportunity for some of these condos the, to, to buy them at a good price and save money and have control over your destiny. And I don't think a lot of retailers think about it. It's a good thing to own your space. That's all I can tell you. It's a good thing. Jay, should Dana come to Chicago? Absolutely. I think we're a bigger market and I think we've got the, the I think we've got the, the density. I think we've got the income level. And I think it's it's uh, and I think the rents are more uh, work better than maybe in New York. I mean, you're talking to someone, if you recall, I opened up my pop up in Soho a couple of years ago and trying to make money paying the kind of rent you got to pay down there is extremely difficult. So I think that Chicago is a friendlier space for a small retailer. Does it make a big difference which neighborhood? Absolutely. Some people don't think about this, especially in Chicago. You need one of two things in a, in a market if you have a retail. You either need lots of high rises where there's just a lot of people that, that are living right by you, or you need parking. But if you've got neither, you got a problem. And if you go through Chicago right now, you can go right through the neighborhood. There are blocks in Chicago that have literally half the stores are empty. And my argument is they don't have parking. They don't have high rises. There's not enough density there. And that's why there's some neighborhoods in Chicago that are doing extremely well. And there's some neighborhoods that are doing extremely poorly. So I think you can find a location in Chicago that has either high rises, parking, or there's an L stop. That's one of the critical pieces of owning a retail store. How about Atlanta, Stephanie? Atlanta is a great place, especially for a business that caters to an African-American clientele. We really are a black mecca. A lot of reasons for that, but most notably that we have a rich density of higher education that are historically black colleges and universities, Spelman and Morehouse, chief among them. So many students go to college in Atlanta, and then they stay for their professional careers. And there's a lot of wealth here in this city, a lot of African-American wealth and entrepreneurship. And we've got uh, great locations. There's neighborhoods that I think would be a really good fit for you. Uh, West side of Atlanta, prices are starting to boom. And I'm not an expert on the real estate market, but I do know that there are some areas of town that are more affordable than others. We do have a good MARTA subway system so places can be accessible via 
a subway or, you know, we do have parking in some areas of town more so than others. I've heard there's some traffic there too. We do have traffic if you're commuting from the suburbs. I live in the city and of course, COVID has changed everything. So I'm not going to be looking through the COVID lens when I make this statement, but I ride my bike almost everywhere. I don't get in my car and it's a total, totally walkable uh, taking MARTA and taking your bike. You can really get around the city quite easily. The other thing about Atlanta that I think would be relevant if you're in a beauty or hair care industry is that we have an entertainment hub here. Because of our film tax credit, we are among the best de destinations in the world to make movies. And so you've got all of this entertainment here and those people need to have their hair and makeup done to be ready for the set. So th there's a market there. Uh, so just depends on what, what market Dana's looking for. But I think this is a wonderfully inviting city. And if you come here, Dana, I will personally show you around. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Plus, Dana needs to be in the movies. Dana, I have a question about your industry. And it, it stems from a conversation I had today, actually, with a private equity firm, where they referenced the barbershop model, which I had never heard of. And it was in reference to Stucky's makes most of our money a lot of People would think it's from our franchise fees, but it's really from the sale of our product. And this man said, oh, you're using the barbershop model, meaning most barbershops make their profit from the sale of hair care products. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how much of your profit is dependent upon or your revenue, if you're willing to share actual mm -hmm. percentages, how much is dependent upon the sale product versus your services, the hair care services? Zero percent. Wow. Yeah. So, and I think that's why I'm proud, maybe naively so, but I'm proud of my business. We've been open eight years, done little to no marketing and sold little to no product and we still make money. So, But should me, you be selling product? I mean, maybe not. You're product. doing well without it. You no, know, we started selling product. You know, COVID kind of made me, you know, add to this and I'm glad I did. But the product that we would sell at, that we sell at our salon are styling product, not uh, maintenance products. So we're not going to sell a lot of shampoos and conditioners because that's why people come to the salon. They come to Carolee Boyd to get for us to shampoo their hair. We did sh sell shampoo years ago um, and it just sat on the shelves when we wind up moving it to our back bar because they're like, no, I want the styling product. I come to you to wash my hair. So we go, okay, we do that. So now we've added, you know, three products. We're about to add two more. Um, to our line to sell, but it's not a factor at all. We make a little bit of money because we just got started, but we're it's not contributing to our bottom line. And so I'm excited about what a purely boy could do in a larger city, because if I'm in a city that's not that dense and I could survive for eight years with word of mouth alone without using retail, imagine what I could do in a New York, Atlanta or Chicago. And what type of marketing data do you look at when you're trying to figure out which city would be the best fit for you? So that's a great question. So for me, I'm strictly looking at population density and how the people in that market wear their hair. So take, for instance, Atlanta. Atlanta, there's a lot of African-American women there. And some people go, oh, Dana, there you go. Well, I have pause because there's a lot of African-American women there that wear a weave. So I'll be able to service them in between their weaves, but I won't be able to put it in or take it out. So therein lies my challenge. Is that the right market for me? Um, for Paralee Boyd, we are hair care, hair health, hair maintenance. So I have to look at population density and how they're wearing their hair. You're not going to be able to go to a market research firm and see how much African-American women are spending on hair care services because the industry is so mom and pop that they're not reporting this data. The companies or the hair care service companies that are reporting this data are not geared towards African-American women hair care, i.e. super cuts, great, lip, great clips, bow ricks, and the like. Those are all geared, or dry bar, those are geared towards um, white women. They have African-American women clientele, but that's not their bread and butter. So that kind of gives you an idea of how innovative Carolee Boyd is because I want to be one of the first national hair salon chains for women of color. It's like Henry Ford trying to get market research on drivability. 
right? It's like, how do you know <laughs> when you're just introducing the car to the market? You kind of have to say where he went, where the people with money who would have the leisure money to buy a horseless carriage. So how will you make your decision of where to go? Without that market research, how will you be able to pick uh, the right city, the right neighborhood? I'm looking at density and I'm looking to see based on the people I know, where do they go get their hair done? So in Chicago, a lot of people go to the Egyptians, and I've seen those salons. Again, they're they're not uniform. Is that the name of the salon? No, they're a, a demographic of people. They have these like Dominican salons in Chicago. They're Egyptians. They're Egyptian salons. So they're and they're mom and pop. They're very small. They're you know looking. How do you manage your money? You look at your Venmo, right? Not a lot of them have a consistent brand. So you go there, you get your hair done a couple of times, you find out where, not where their density is, but for me, it's, I need to find the address that my market will feel good going to. So when they see the address, they go, oh, okay, it's there. But you, and they have to be able to park. Walkability for Pearly Boyd is not ideal, right? The women aren't deciding, I'm a destination, so they're not, oh, let's go grab lunch and we'll go get our hair done. No, they go get their hair done so they can go do everything else. You just brought up a key element of retail that's changed dramatically. It used to be it was all about your location. Now it's half your location and it's half your Internet uh, website. So to your point, they see an address. It's part of the branding. Oh, that's in the South Loop. I'm going there. Whereas if you put the store in the wrong place, it's just not going to be appealing to people. So the address is that that wasn't the case 20 years ago. It's the how you look on the on your website is critical. So you're right. It's about the address. The right address. What did you think of uh, what Stephanie had to say about Atlanta? Did that sound intriguing to you? I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, I know, you know, that's all. It's it's not news, right? You know, Mel Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, all the, you know, HBCUs that are there. And a thriving entrepreneurial community as well. It is. Yep. So Ch Atlanta is the last chocolate city. And, you know, <laughs> the black community has had chocolate cities since the Great Migration. At one time, it was Chicago. At one point, it was Detroit. Uh, at one point, it was even New York. Um, and so because we haven't really done a lot of um, migration, the last one was Atlanta. Um, I think the second or the next one to come up is going to be Houston. Um, and that's great. I just want to make sure that the places I go to look for that population density, those women are getting their hair done the way that would make Carolee Boyd a viable option. If they're getting weaves and braids and wigs and stuff, that's not where I want to go. You could argue if this is a test case for a national expansion, maybe Atlanta is got is is too heavily African American to where someone could argue, oh well it worked there because everyone knows how, you know, it's a majority. Whereas it maybe maybe Chicago is more of a medium size demographic that would fit better rolling it out to the country. So I, I got a belief for someone looking to roll out nationally, that's a consideration. Mm -hmm. But you want to go where your customer base is. You fish where the fish are, right? And but it, but so part say, oh, of the well, national model it. is, I mean, you go where there are customers that are going to be using this product. And as mm -hmm. you become more and more profitable, you can afford to get in markets that may not be as dense. Exactly. But getting back to the data, I'm really fascinated with this lack of access to data. And honestly, I'm embarrassed to say I hadn't thought of the nuances, of not only small businesses, but small minority businesses and the challenges with accessing that critical data. I would love to see some enterprising entrepreneur, hopefully someone listening, data is becoming democratized now and with apps and people constantly inputting different aspects of their lives online. It just seems like very soon this type of data should be more readily available. You know, just if, if they're all using the Venmo app, if it's a click away from starting to keep track of what type of customers you have, what their demographic is. I, I just think in a matter of years, we're going to see a lot of this data more available. It can also be scary. Mm -hmm. There's some big brother components to this for sure, but more and more data is becoming available. And even a company like Stucky is what we're able to mine with our lim limited resources getting on Google Analytics. It's really interesting to me how you can capture data even on a shoestring budget.
there it was frustrating for me. Well, it's been a challenge. There's no data on African American women in services and the, how much wow. money they get in services. There is on product because they get the data from your big box stores. Sure. Right. Yeah. So your targets and, you know, whatever your Sally's, they get that information from there. But when you're going to African American women getting their hair done, everything is so micro. You know, I've been hopping salons for weeks looking and trying to talk to different stylists. And, you know, when you ask them the question, how much money did you make in 2019? Forget 2020. How much money did you make in 2019? Everybody goes to their phone and picks up their cash app or their Venmo. You ask them, do you have QuickBooks? And they're like, for what? How much money did you spend on product? They don't really know. Wow. You just described the picture framing industry. You could ask someone, how much did your frame store gross last year? They, they don't even know. So this isn't just what market you're in. It's a typical ma and pa small industry. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have to wing it. Unfortunately, I have to wing it. I came back to Detroit because I used to live here. I'm comfortable going to New York outside of what the MTA is doing because I used to live there. But now if you're looking to expand to Chicago, which is top of my list, or in Atlanta, which is a third on my list, then you have to wing it and lean on the people that you know, lean on the black women that I know, um, that know people there, the other businesses owner, business owners that I know, um, and just ask questions. And then next, you've got to go. You've got to spend time there and, and watch where people go get their hair done and go get your hair done there to make sure that you're offering something different. And how much of a hurdle is that if you're pitching, say, to a VC firm trying to get capital? Because so often they want data driven metrics when they're deciding which companies are going to invest in. It's, it's a challenge because the mindset, I hate to say this, but the mindset in that world is here are the things that you can show us that show that you're a viable That's person. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, but if you look at that, where would Coca-Cola be? Where would Ford Motor Company be? All of these, I, what's frustrating to me about the VC and, and that VC world and that whole equity world is that they're not, uh, how much innovation are you looking for? They're really How not. None of them would have invested in Coca-Cola or Ford, exactly. right? <laughs> Those firms exactly. would never have gotten a That's dime. Exactly. From there's there's a famous story about the Xerox machine. They invented the Xerox machine. They did research and the research came back and said, yeah, nobody really wants it. I didn't invent the hair salon, but I invented a new way to, to that process. Tell us what that is, Dana, especially for people who may not have been listening to previous podcasts. Sure. It's lean manufactured. It's walk-in only seven days a week. So we don't take appointments. No matter how much volume we do, we can see, you know, in our prime before COVID, it was nothing for us to open up and have 15 women lined up outside of our salon on a Sunday. All of them walking only, all of them getting in and out in under a certain amount of time because I've leaned out the processes. Now, my guests don't feel that. The customers don't feel that. But my hair traffic controller and my staff are managing that flow through processes. So for me, when you're looking to attract a VC, they're like, well, I need to see this, 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 and this, which is fine. But there are certain things you're not going to see because the data is not there. Also, the African-American dollar is not what people are looking at anywhere. Big mistake. Yes, <laughs> like, big mistake. mistake. Like, what are you doing? African-American, African-Americans, period. You're looking at, oh, well, will this app go viral? Yeah, if enough black people want, download it, sure. The buying power. And so then they're not even looking at the buying power of the African-American woman outside of product. African-American women go get their hair done two to four times a month and they spend $65 minimum to get it done. Do that math and be the wow. only one. So Dana, have you looked into doing this kind of market research yourself? Could you pay for this? Too costly. No, even too costly. Know, and for up. what? You know, because right. it you're, there's no guarantee a VC firm is even going to invest in you if you do have the data. And then usually they're going to want a significant amount of equity. The so there's a trade-off. The only way the data is going to come is when I grow. 
And then I'll be able to report the data for the next person coming behind me. But if I really wanted to invest my time or the time of a team to walk into these salons in these cities, one, you're not going to get accurate data. They're not going to tell you how much money they made. Are you kidding me? If they even know, if they even know. It, well, a lot of them know because it's electronic, but guess what? A lot of them are paying taxes on it. Yeah, absolutely. So they're not going to tell you, right? So the only way this data gets organized is if Dana expands. And the only way Dana is expands is if she finds a VC or finds someone in the equity world that realizes the buying power of the African-American woman and understand that Dana is solving a problem that hasn't been solved before. The health care and the walk, the hair care, rather, and the, the giving women back their time, the walk in only hair care solution. It's not just solving a problem and, and offering a very different niche of service, but it's also you have a tribe. That's what I refer to Seth Godin's marketing principles a lot when I talk about branding. And he refers to tribes, know who your tribe is, who is your customer. You have a very strong sense of who your customer is. And when you know that, then you can brand to the right audience. You can make sure your dollars are most strategic. And that's who's going to come in and spend money. I mean, yep. that's, then, you've got it all. It's just and then getting that extra a, capital. Yeah. And so moving to a city where the density shows that this is a viable business, that you can make the money. And, you know, yes, I've been open for eight years in, in Metro Detroit, but I haven't hit the dollar amount that would make somebody go, oh, maybe we should invest in her. I had a VC tell me, I think your business is amazing. I don't want you to take on VC at all. And this was a VC. He said, I'm going to tell you something that my colleagues would scream at me for. Do not give away a percentage of Paralee Boyd because the value of Paralee Boyd today is going to be crazy in 10 years. Build it yourself. Don't tell anybody I told you that. I said, okay. So that's what I got excited after demo day. Okay. Now we're back to, here's $150,000. Let's look at the cities where you can launch and let's grow it and just laugh in five years when you all are trying to become equity partners with me. And I'm like, but didn't I tell you like five years ago that this was a great idea? A $100,000 investment? I mean, that is... That is so reasonable an ask. <laughs> I, I, I invested $30,000. When I opened Southfield, I opened with $30,000 and grew it to three hundred dollars in a year. Wow. Uh, without I, marketing, I, without retail. Word of mouth. The mouth. other side of this thing, that raising money and building a successful business are two completely different things because I've seen examples yes. of someone who is expert at spinning a tail and telling this fantasy story with all wrong numbers, I might add, raising tens of millions of dollars and doing nothing but burning through the money because the business won't work. So it's it, they're two different animals. Just because you got a good story doesn't mean the business will work. And just because your business will work doesn't mean that you're going to be able to raise money for sure. We're running short of time, but before we leave this, Dana, do you have a timeline in mind? Do you know when you'd like to make a decision by? I'd like to make a decision by the end of March, and I'd like to be opening or in the process of opening by this fall. I'm waiting to see how the vaccine does. I'm waiting to see if there's any you know, new strands that can't be fought. I'm still keeping my eye on COVID um, and just waiting to see you know, what I learn about the different markets I'm looking to go to. So we will certainly be coming back to this. Uh, I, I want to ask all three of you, uh, t today in the 21 Hats Morning Report, I uh, highlighted a, uh, a guide that ran in Inc. Magazine. It's a guide, uh, an entrepreneur's guide to using Clubhouse. And I know Dane is there. I'm curious, Stephanie, Jay, do you know what Clubhouse is? Have you experimented with it? Is it a porno site? <laughs> I am on Clubhouse too. I just got on Dana, so we'll have to. I'll I'll be sure to follow you. I just oh, cool. joined. I just yeah. joined. Okay, so Dana, I want to hear you explain to Jay what Clubhouse is. Jay, Clubhouse yes. is <laughs> hyper networking. So it's a social media app where similar to Facebook, but better. How is it better? 
you join a room of the, of a topic that they are discussing that you're interested in. So for example, I'm interested in writing. So I have been in rooms where they are, you're online with writers, you're online with agents, you're online with publishers, and you can ask questions. And then if you have more questions or if there's synergy, you can follow them on Instagram and you can message them. A lot of wonderful things um, have happened. I'm interested in podcasting. That has led, it has opened up doors. Um, I'm, I've got, you know, I dabble in the Michigan cannabis medical marijuana area. That through Clubhouse has opened up doors and allowed me to talk to people I would not have had the opportunity to talk to that Google or finding it online. It's not going to put you in front of those people in California, Oregon, Oklahoma. So if there's something you're looking for for your business, how do I merchandise this or how do I market this? You can go into a marketing room. There's also famous people on it because it's still kind of small and limited to only iPhone users. A couple nights ago, 100 people were in a room with Matthew Knowles, Beyonce Knowles' father. And they were taking questions. I've had the privilege of talking to Ted Gibson, a very well-known um, hairstylist, in a room of small people. You ask a question, um, they're like, oh, you know, why don't you message me and we'll connect. And next thing you know, two days later, you're on the phone with this person. I would add it's invitation only. But we could arrange that. And ah. it's more intimate. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll invite you, Jay. You have to have a yeah. member invite well, wait, you, wait, but Dana, you're limited. Dana, how, how long have you been doing this, Clubhouse? Since uh, I think January, December. Really? So it's been a couple yeah, months. Myself. No one's invited me over to the clubhouse. I'm just finding out accidentally because Lauren brought it up. Very interesting. That's why we're talking about it, Jay. I, I want to get everybody on this podcast into clubhouse and uh, we're going to get a room. Yep. And I, I just want to add one. Uh, well, two quick points. One is that it's more intimate Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more curated than anything you might see on LinkedIn or some of these other forums. And then it's also more in depth. So tonight I'm doing my first room and it's the future of retail. Mm -hmm. And I'm also signed up for entrepreneurship. And I was super excited when I went on this morning and I saw someone that I really admire who's in my space, who's head of retail for a major chain, followed me. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to try to get in a room with him. And yeah, like Dana, can I DM you and talk to you about getting in your stores, that kind of thing. So it's yeah. it's an in-depth access. It's a lot more than just a LinkedIn connection. It's having real conversations. Real conversations. Dana, can you imagine something tangible that Jay would get out of it? What What would be the allure for him? If Jay's talking about succession planning, if Jay's looking at, you know, if there's another growth opportunity that he has, he could be in a room with uh, manufacturers of, you know, home furnishings and talk to them about what they're doing during COVID. And if he wanted to ship internationally or if he wanted a different client base, all of that, these people are in these rooms and they're all talking and they're connecting with each other. I've been in a lot of beauty rooms. Again, it's very stylist driven. The business owners are, are landlords, technically. They're booth renters. So when I get up to speak, I'm sharing my ideas. Well, Dana, maybe you can show me how to set my business up like yours because I'm 60 and I'm tired of doing hair. Like I become a resource for them. I should say uh, I've been on Clubhouse for a week or two, and and Dana's kind of been my uh, uh, unofficial welcomer. Uh, she's dragged me into several rooms and introduced me around a little bit, which I have appreciated. Uh, the best story I've heard about Clubhouse, Dana, is the one you told about what happened when you went into the podcast room and, and you introduced yourself and you said that uh, you, you have interest in starting your own podcast. And tell us the reaction of the people uh, who were who are on the stage in that room. It was, it was amazing. So, you know, a lot of it is how you present yourself. If you sound like this and you really don't want to talk, your reactions kind of get different. You know me, I'm high energy. So I introduced myself and the moderators all had anywhere between, you know, 50 to 60,000 downloads of their podcast per month, hundreds of thousands of followers. And the guy said, okay, right now, everybody who's interested in helping me launch Dana's podcast, raise your hand and we'll invite you to the stage. Dana, I want you to take a screenshot of this stage 
and then follow each of us on Instagram. When you launch, tag all of us. And not only will you tag us, but we will share your podcast with everybody on our, on our, who follows us. And he said, who's going to join me? 20 people came up to the stage. And then when they thought some of these people had questions, a lot of them said, oh, no, no, no. I was just here for Dana's launch so she could get my picture. So that, that's the type of networking. Jay, have we sold you? Are you going to join Clubhouse? I'm like, my head's spinning. So <laughs> I, I don't even have a reaction because I just, I, I always wonder where people have time. And that's a legitimate question. I'm really interested that you invited Lauren to go and that Lauren didn't pick up the old phone. Hey, Jay, I'm going over here. You want to go with me? So I'm just, still- <laughs> I'm doing it right now, Jay. I'm going to answer that. Like you've heard me, you've heard Stephanie, you've heard, I know Lauren, you know, podcaster doesn't want to grow their podcast. So that's when I'm in podcast stuff. I always ping Lauren. But if I knew, Hey Dana, I want to do this for my business. You know, I'd be pinging you. Sometimes I ping Lauren 10 o'clock at night, Lauren, get in here. Like, <laughs> and he's like, can't right now, Dana. But if I knew what you were interested in, Jay, I'd ping you and I listen I listen when I'm, when I have time to listen to stuff. So when other times I have downtime, I'm not on a call or I'm not on a zoom or I'm not needing to focus on something on my computer, I'm listening, um, to clubhouse. And that means, I mean, I tell you now I'm constantly working. I'm constantly working because I'm always listening in between. Uh, My downtime is now listening. And at night before I go to bed, I'm in bed listening. Stephanie, have you found uh, it difficult to make good use of your time in Clubhouse? Do you, I mean, I've, I know I've wasted a good bit of time in rooms where I shouldn't have been. Uh, how have you done? I just joined. Tonight is my first room on the retail experience, but I've also signed up for entrepreneurs, giving your pitch, funding, finding funding for your business. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how it develops. You know, there's one called Hustle which looks really interesting to me. So marketing, there's a bunch of marketing ones. So ask me in a week or two. Then Dana, I'm following you now. Oh, great. Thank you. Jay, we're going to get you there and we're going to do a, a 21 hats room on, on Clubhouse. Jay, okay. you have 51 friends on Clubhouse and I'm inviting you now. Wow. There you go. People who are listening, follow us on Clubhouse. I'm on there as Stucky Stop. I'm at Dana Alexis. All right, guys. My thanks to Dana White, Jay Goltz, and Stephanie Stuckey. As always, appreciate you guys sharing. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.